All right, so this is topic 20, the HL portion of organic chemistry. I'm going to focus on a few things. Mainly, the first thing that we really want to focus on are the, uh, the diagrams of electron movement that are required for every single type of reaction. And so um, we're going to focus on that in um, this um, first on nucleophilic substitution. And so our first emphasis is going to be looking at nucleophilic substitution and how we have to diagram these reactions and the differences between the, yes sorry are you are you sharing your screen uh yes are you like, uh okay i can't see anything because it's like all black uh okay hold on a second let's see yeah i see it now thank you oh that's weird okay let's see better uh yes okay all right so Nucleophilic substitution, there are differences between the degrees of the um, halogen and alkane that we're going through, and that will determine how our arrows look, how our um, intermediate steps look, and things like that. And so the first thing we're going to focus on is our first degree. Okay, Our first degree um, halogen and alkane. looks something like this. And because it's only a first degree, the ability for the Cl to break off, even though it's a polar bond, is very difficult because the carbon is not very stable because it's not supported by other carbons, not many carbons around it. And so what has to happen here is that the OH attacks the carbon, meaning that it tries to form a bond with the carbon, which then will knock off the bond that it has the chlorine and then allow the chloride to break off as an ion. And so these two things happen simultaneously. And so this is why you have this kind of what we call um, a transition state. Okay. This transition state isn't technically like observable but it's implied that it has to happen for this to occur and so at this one instant in time there are partial bonds between the hydroxide that's attacking and the chlorine that is going to be breaking off and so eventually that chlorine breaks off and then you're left with the final result Of the alcohol and that chloride ion that's being produced as well okay and so what the ib is looking for here when you're trying to illustrate this is one mark for the attack of the lone pair of oh to the carbon you have to point it toward the carbon it's really important that curly arrows are always pointed either at atoms or pointed at bonds where they're forming additional bonds. And so notice I'm very direct about this, that I always start with, start from a pair of electrons and I point it at an atom or point it at a bond if I'm making a double bond or something like that. In this case, I'm just pointing at all atoms. The second mark is the breaking of that carbon to chlorine bond. Now you could show it here or you could show it in the transition state like I drew here. Either way, you have to show that bond being broken. And then the third mark, is for this entire structure with the brackets, the partial bonds, the transition state with the negative charge on the outside. So that whole setup here is required for the third mark in the question if they ask you to illustrate this out. So really important that you are illustrating all this out to get maximum credit for these um, questions. So to, to diagram the mechanism, this is what you need to show. Now, as we dig in deeper, this first step, first step, or really the only step in the whole process, is the slow step. Because remember, this all happens in one step. 
like the OH attacks the carbon and the CL breaks off simultaneously to form the compound. So there's only really one step, but that's the first step and that's the slow step. And tying back to topic 16, the slow step involves all the species that affect the rate of reaction. And so what you'll see here is that because in the slow step, the halogenoalkane and the OH- minus are participating, that the rate is dependent on both those concentrations. And so what we say is that this reaction is a substitution nucleophilic bimolecular, which is known as an SN2 reaction because it requires two species in the slow step, SN2. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is the solvent of choice, because we have two choices here. We either want a protic solvent that has hydrogen bonding or an aprotic solvent, which has no hydrogen bonding. And so in this case, we want an aprotic solvent with no hydrogen bonding because you want the carbon in this molecule to be the most positive thing that attracts the hydroxide to it. You don't want a solvent that deters or distracts the OH from attacking that carbon. So you want no hydrogen bonding. Um, you want the focus to be on the halogenoalkane and the hydroxide reacting. If you had something like water as your solvent, it would attract the OH away from the halogenoalkane and slow the reaction down. So if they ask you, you want an aprotic solvent in an SN2 because of the lack of hydrogen bonding prevents interference with the nucleophiles attack on the carbon. Something like ether, or I guess diethyl ether. Or actually, we don't use that terminology here. We would use um, ethoxyethane. Something like this doesn't have a hydrogen that's attached to an O that's protic. And so it can act as a solvent here without interfering and without attracting the OH- minus from it. It's a fairly nonpolar substance. Questions on that? In a tertiary halogen alkane, it actually happens in two steps, and you have what's called an intermediate step um, that occurs here. And so what happens here is the first thing that happens is the Cl breaks off, okay? Creates what we call a carbocation intermediate. And that positive charge allows the hydroxide to attack that carbon. And so it attracts that hydroxide to it and then forms the new alcohol and the Cl minus. Now, in this process, it's kind of a two-step process. You break off the chlorine, and then the OH attacks. But the OH will attack very quickly as soon as the positive charge is present. And so that step happens very quickly. The step that determines the reaction is that first step again. <clears throat> 
So this slow step of breaking off the chlorine first. And so in this one, because the OH is not participating in the slow step, it only depends on the halogenoalkane. And so this is substitution nucleophilic unimolecular, meaning that it only has one molecule involved in slow step, which is why it's SN1. Now with this solvent, you actually want to help stabilize that positive charge. And so you actually want a polar protic solvent that has hydrogen bonding because it will stabilize the carbocation. Because remember, water's polar, but it's not a full positive or a full negative charge. It's a partial positive and partial negative. And so what happens here is it surrounds the carbocation to make it more stable with its partial negative charge, but it's not going to prevent the fully negative hydroxyl, hydroxide to attack that po fully positive carbon. And so while it provides stabilization, it doesn't actually interfere with the reaction here. In fact, it helps it by providing some stability of the ions that are present. And so, and the fact is the hydroxide is not involved in that first step. And so the fact that there's hydrogen bond here doesn't actually prevent the hydroxide from attacking the species. Uh, wait, Mr. Shang, I'm sorry. Could you repeat why, how the solvent stabilizes the carbocation? Yeah, sure. So what you want to imagine here is that the, the, the solvent has a partial negative charge. Let me illustrate it here. So let's say it's water, for example. So water has that partial negative charge on the oxygen. So what will happen is that water molecules will kind of surround Let me illustrate this a little bit better. We'll kind of surround the carbocation with its partial negative charge. And that makes it more stable because it's not as positively charged because it's actually weakly attracted to all these negative, partial negatives of water. So it's less unstable than if it was just a pure positive charge. But that attraction is only useful until the hydroxide comes in there and attacks because the hydroxide is a full negative charge and it's going to be more attracted to that full positive and then that's going to create this. So really the water, the solvent that's hydrogen bonding is just kind of a stabilizer until the hydroxide has the ability to come and attack it. Oh, okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, the hydrogen bonding surrounds the positive charge until the hydroxide can attack it. Now, for, for secondary, it can happen either way. So you could choose either mechanism unless the question specifically states which SN1 or SN2 you need to represent um, for a secondary, you could do either one. Now, along the same lines, there are three factors that affect the rate of reaction for all of these reactions. Okay. One is the nature of the nucleophile. Oops. So what is actually attaching here? And an anion is always going to be a better nucleophile 
than a neutral molecule. So that's why OH minus is better than water here. So if there's, if there's a choice, the OH minus is always going to be the better nucleophile. It's going to happen more quickly. Two. The nature of the halogen. Okay, so what halogen are we dealing with here? Because that has to do with okay, bond enthalpy. And the weaker the bond, the easier it is for it to break. And so in this case, what we want is a larger halogen Here. So CI is the weakest bond, and so therefore it will happen the most quickly. So if you have to compare two identical structures and the only difference is the halogen, the I one will always react faster. And last but not least, the nature of the, um, the halogenoalkane. which we mean by the degree of it. So is it our primary, secondary, or tertiary? In a tertiary, actually, is the fastest one because a tertiary one requires the formation of a carbocation, which is much more likely than the, the idea that the hydroxide will attack the carbon on the opposite side of the chlorine in a primary and kick it off. So the probability of that happening is much more unlikely. And so a tertiary one will always happen faster because the breaking of a bond in this form, which don't forget we call heterolytic fission, is much more likely than the OH attacking from the opposite side of the chlorine to kick it off and form that transition state. And so you will see the tertiary one always be faster. And so I would use this to, to differentiate between um, which structure will happen the fastest and then use the nature of the halogen as a tiebreaker. Cause that's a really popular multiple choice question. They'll say, which of the following halogen alkanes would react the fastest? So you would eliminate all the primary and secondary ones first, you'd leave the tertiary ones. And then of the tertiary ones, the one that has the, the weaker bond would then be the fastest. So the, the, the tertiary one with the I would be the fastest of all possible re rates of reaction. questions about that. So the fastest one is tertiary with an I and then followed by tertiary with BR, followed by tertiary with CL, followed by tertiary with F and then secondary. And the worst one would be a primary with F bond. Now, let's go on into electrophilic addition. Now, we talked about this a little bit with an SL about how you're attacking an electrophile and then you're creating kind of these, um, these new bonds. And so, for example, what you might see is something like this, where you might have a slightly polar molecule. And what happens is the double bond attacks this hydrogen, the more positive end, and then breaking off the bond to form 
this carbocation, which then the Br minus attacks and forms. the halogeno alkane in this case. Now, what's nice about this is that it doesn't matter where you add the H and where you add the Br because you'll still get one bromoethane because this is a symmetrical structure. Symmetrical alkene, okay? And symmetrical alkene just means that across the double bond carbon, there's the same groups on both carbons, so it doesn't affect how your overall thing. So another symmetrical alkene might be something like this, right? Because both carbons have a CH3 attached to it, and both carbons have an H attached to it, so it's symmetrical. They don't have to be cis and trans, which we'll talk about later. It's just the fact that there's the same um, groups on each of those carbons. With HL, of course, it gets more complicated because what you'll have here is you'll have asymmetrical alkenes, where now the carbocation you produce can be one of two possibilities. And so let's say you have something like this, and you add... an H to this. Well, there's technically two places that this H could add to. It could add to the first carbon which would form this carbocation or it could add on to the other one and form this carbocation. Okay, and then the Br would proceed to attack this carbon or this carbon to produce two different halogenoalkanes. One being a primary halogenoalkane, being one bromo but um, propane, excuse me, or you might have a secondary one, which is two bromo but uh, propane, excuse me. So one of these is more likely to happen than the other. And so this is where Markovnikov's rule comes into play. Because he simplified things to say this, okay? You add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens bonded already. So he was saying, well, you add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens already. So therefore, that would make this the major pathway. Because notice this hydrogen that was being added is either being added here or here. And his rule states you add it to the carbon with the most hydrogens already. So in this case, the carbon on the right already has the most hydrogens, so therefore, the bottom pathway would be the major pathway, which would then lead us to this product, this being the major product, and this being the minor product. Another way to phrase Markovnikov's rule is essentially Whichever one provides a higher degree product is your better, is your major product. Because notice, when he says adding hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens, that means he's saying add hydrogens to the lesser degree carbon, 
so that the Br can bond to the greater degree carbon. So with that idea, you can say it that way as well. You can just say whichever product has the higher degree, that will be the major product in electrophilic addition. Questions about that? Okay. Now, let's get into the most fun thing, which is a f electrophilic substitution of benzene or the nitration of benzene for a, a shorter term. This is something that the IB loves to ask about. So it's something that I, I don't want to overlook when we're reviewing here. And the idea here is because benzene does not undergo electrophilic addition. Like we said in the SL section, because that would ruin the stability of the alternating double bond resonance ring that's occurring. So what we have to do is we have to substitute, replace one of the H's with something else. And the way the IB addresses that is to mix nitric acid with sulfuric acid to make this really strong electrophile. And that electrophile is attracted to the benzene. And so what you'll have first is benzene. And yes, one of the double bonds will react and attack the NO2 to form, oh, sorry. a carbocation. But like we said before, that carbocation can't s remain that way. And so what happens is that HSO4 minus takes away that hydrogen. And then that bond returns here. So notice again, whenever you draw an arrow, you either start at a pair of electrons, which is a bond, you either point to an atom or you point to a bond where you're adding an additional bond. In this case, we're adding to additional bond. And so this ends up being this, okay, nitrobenzene. And you've replaced the hydrogen that was on that carbon with an NO2, but you've retained the resonance structure. And this is known as nitrobenzene. And that's how you that's how you electrophilically substitute benzene to make nitrobenzene. Now, they might have you, they will probably most likely have you diagram that out. Like if they're having you draw a mechanism, that's gonna be the mechanism. The other aspect of it is knowing the conditions needed to convert nitrobenzene. into phenylamine or aminobenzene by the method of... Um, Charlie? Yes, Sara. I'm oh, sorry, I just had a question. So what happens to the sulfuric acid? Does it just kind of like, is it still one of the products or no? Uh, oh, I, yeah, if you want to, I, that's a good point. I would write it like that, yes. Okay, thank you. That's a good point. I kind of overlooked that. 
Now, to convert the nitrobenzene into phenylamine, you have a two-step process here. The first one is tin with HCl, and the second step is sodium hydroxide. Now, knowing those um, re reagents is really important. That's what they would ask you about in this um, manner. But as kind of an aside, what essentially happens here is through step one, you make NH3+. You remove all the oxygens and you add hydrogens. So it's essentially the reduction of nitrobenzene. And then after you have too many hydrogens, you add the base to neutralize that NH3 to form it into NH2. This always seems to show up on exams, and so I definitely um, feel like it's important to kind of go over and make sure you know. Questions about that? This idea of reduction segues into um, our other type of reduction that we need to know for HL is reduction back, oops, to alcohols. And knowing the reagents, you don't need to know arrows or anything like that. You just need to know the reagents um, that are needed to reduce a carboxylic acid or an aldehyde or a ketone back to an alcohol. And so a carboxylic acid back to a primary alcohol, because that's the only way you can make a carboxylic acid, is a two-step process because you have to reduce it twice. And so what that means is you need a stronger reducing agent. And so that reducing agent is lithium aluminum hydride in ether. Because it's so reactive, you can't put it in water or the, um, it'll react with the water instead of the carboxylic acid. Now, with an aldehyde or a ketone, when you reduce back to a primary alcohol or back to a secondary alcohol, because you only require one step, you you can use a weaker reducing agent in the case of sodium borohydride NaBH4 in water. The sodium borohydride is not as reactive with water, and so it's safe to use in water to accomplish the same task. One last thing I've been kind of emphasizing throughout this section with the arrows and stuff like that, but I do want to differentiate on this before we move on to isomers. There is a difference between curly arrows and fish hooks. Oops. And the IB will use both these terms, so make sure that you're familiar with them. A curly arrow represents two electrons, okay? And so this is a movement of electrons here where you'll see in something like nucleophilic substitution. You'll see it in electrophilic addition and substitution. It's a form of, well, I actually I don't want to say heterolithation, but so... When you're drawing curly arrows in those cases, you're showing a movement of a pair of electrons, forming bonds, breaking bonds, etc. cetera. 
fish hooks only represent one electron. And this has to do with free radical substitution where you have homolytic fission. So what you would see here is fish hooks that would split. So a fish hook only has one half of the head. And so each of those represent one electron being broken, um, the bond being broken and one electron being going to each CL. So fish hooks for free radicals, curly arrows for all other mechanisms and things like that. Okay, questions about that. Okay. Isomers. Okay. In SL, we talked about just structural isomers, meaning that the bonds changed and the names changed because the position and the type of function groups changed in them. In HL, we talk about stereoisomers, isomers that are different um, when oriented in 3D space. So now, if you do normal convention naming of these, They'll have the same name because they're all bonded the, to the same carbons and oxygen, things like that. But when you actually place them in three-dimensional space, you'll realize that you can't make them the same as each other by just rotating molecules around. You'd have to break a bond and move it somewhere else in 3D space to be able to do that. And so the first one we talk about are... Cis trans isomers, okay? Cis trans isomers are due to restricted rotation, whether that's due to a double bond, C to C, or a ring that doesn't allow the groups on the carbons to rotate around in 3D space freely. And so what we see here is something like this. Okay. With cis and trans, you need identical groups on both carbons to be able to compare them and identify whether it's cis and trans. And so here we can look at just the hydrogens or the chlorines in this case because they're the same on both. And so... If you look at these groups and you look at you compare them across the carbon to carbon double bond plane, and this is written in bow tie configuration. This is the manner in which the IB generally draws um, these cis and trans isomers to show the the plane that's formed. Depending on where those same groups are determines what type it is. This is a trans isomer, and this would be a cis isomer, meaning trans meaning across from each other cis meaning on the same side of the plane as each other. Because if you name these without the cis and trans, they would be the same thing. They would be 1,2-dichloroethene. And so the fact is, because of that double bond that's there, they can't, you couldn't make them the same structure by rotating around bonds. And so they do have different properties and they have different characteristics. In fact, especially with these, this has to do with their IMFs because if we look at the polarity here, this one, 
versus this one, this is fairly nonpolar because the regions of polarity kind of cancel each other out. Whereas this one is significantly polar because the vectors that have polarity are going in the same direction. So there is a distinct polarity that's present. So here you may have only LDFs, but here you have dipole dipole, which means stronger IMFs. And you can witness that based on the boiling point of each of these, because the boiling point of this is 47.5 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of this is 60.3 degrees Celsius. So that polarity is shown within those physical properties that are dependent on how strong IMFs are. Namely, boiling point is the easiest one to kind of refer to. So a trans versus cis, if there's a difference in polarity, in this case there is, you'll see that um, observed in the different physical properties. questions about that uh could you also go over like the stackability of both of them and like how that relates to melting point because i was a bit confused about that yeah sure stackability is when molecules start slowing down and they start to get closer and closer to each other um the ability for them to stack on top of each other is based on kind of their polarity and so when you have a polar molecule Molecules have to start reorienting to reorienting themselves so that they all line up so that they can then become crystals because you have a positive and you have negative. And so if the molecules come together and they're both positives, then the other one has to reorient itself to kind of be able to stack on top of each other. But when you have a trans molecule where there's nonpolar um, um, nonpolar um, character, the molecules can stack any way they want on top of each other and solidify that way. And so you'll notice that the, um, the melting point of this one is actually higher because of the stackability in there. This also has to do more with like kind of cis and trans like fatty acids because of the way the double bond, um, the the, um, the cis molecules creates kinks in the structure, which then doesn't make it as linear, which makes the structure more difficult to stack on top of each other as well. Does that kind of make sense, Sarah? Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. <laughs> no, no problem. E and Z became a convention because not every um, of these isomers had a situation where you had the same group on each one. And so this was based on priority of atomic number. So now it didn't matter that there were different groups. You, you could do this based on the atomic number of the atoms attached to it. And so if you had something like this versus something like this, because you don't have the same groups on any of these carbons to compare cis and trans, E and Z had to be implemented to distinguish this. And the thing is, E and Z, even though they mean the same thing as cis and trans, meaning E being a cross and Z being the same, like trans and cis respectively, they're talking about it in terms of different groups. And so you can have a trans that's a Z or a cis that's an E. So they don't always align with each other. And what I mean by this, is uh, what I mean by atomic numbers, I look at what's bonded to the carbon. And so this carbon on the left here has a BR and H. BR has the entire atomic number, so it gets priority. And then we look at this C, has F and CL. 
Well, that CL has a higher atomic number, so that has priority. On this one, the Br is up here and the Cr is down here. And so if we notice that the when we look at the two atoms or two species that have priority, depending on where they are relative to each other on the plane, that tells us that this is Z and this is E. And so you look at the two groups bonded to each carbon and you circle one of them. And then you compare the two circles that you circled um, to see where they are relative to the plane. Questions on that? Let me show you what I was talking about before. Let's say we have something like this. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, so if we had a structure like this, if we're doing cis and trans, the OHs are the same group across from each other, so this would be considered trans. But if we're looking at atomic number priority, BR gets priority over OH, and this OH gets priority over the CH3 because it has a high atomic number bonded to the carbon. The O is higher than C, so then this would be Z. So even though... So you could have a trans and a Z or a trans and an E or a cis and a Z, cis and E. They're not always related to it because they use different conventions for identifying what gets priority. So don't always assume every trans molecule is an E molecule as well. Optical isomers. Our other type of stereo isomers that we have to focus on here requires a chiral carbon for that to occur. A chiral carbon is a carbon bonded to four different groups. And those different groups can be different length of carbon chains as well. It doesn't have to be four completely different elements that are bonded. So, for example, if we look at something like butan 2 all This carbon is a chiral carbon. Because it has four groups on it. It has an H group, an OH group, a CH3 group, and then a CH3CH2 group. You treat the whole thing as one chain. And so you can write this in this manner, which is known as kind of the wedge dash notation. The wedge dash notation helps you show uh, three-dimensional um, orientation on on paper now because it's chiral it can have what we call a mirror image and that is called an enantiomer okay and so the enantiomer can be drawn one of two ways you can either draw it literally as a mirror image Or if you want to keep it oriented the same way, just swap the two things on the wedge and dash. Just don't do both because then it'll undo what you're doing. 
So either of those two in the red or green are the mirror image of the original Butin 2 all that I drew in black there. Now, an interesting physical property that enantiomers have each other, and let me just make sure I clarify. No one isomer is the quote-unquote right isomer. And so these two isomers are enantiomers of each other. Just kind of like how there's no one right isomer, they're isomers of each other. So I don't call the one in black the correct isomer, I, the correct model, and then the one in red or green the enantiomer of that. They're both enantiomers of each other. So just kind of be careful with the terminology there. But what makes this interesting is they rotate plane polarized light. Differently. Whereas one will rotate it clockwise and one will rotate it counterclockwise. And we can't tell by looking at the structure which one's which. We actually have to put it into a system to be able to measure that. And so keywords here, plain polarized light is the main kind of phrase here. This is a good diagram of what's happening in a polarimeter, which is the device you use to identify whether it's, um, one enantiomer versus the other enantiomer based on how it rotates. And so notice down here, they filter out the light so that's only one plane. And that plane passes through the sample, and the sample rotates it one way or the other. And at the end, we rotate this film to see how much it rotated to try to line it back up with the light. Okay. Now, if we at the end see no rotation and we know it's a chiral molecule, that means we have a 50-50 mix. Which means we have half, 50% one enantiomer, 50% the other enantiomer, and they cancel each other out. And that is known as a racemic mixture. So whenever you have a sample that you know is, is chiral, but it doesn't ro rotate plane polarized light, that tells you I have the same amount of each enantiomer in there so they cancel each other out rotation-wise. Uh, Mr. Trung, I think you're muted. Sorry. You're fine. What I was saying is you don't need to know the whole process of the polarimeter here. What you need to know is just the general idea of that it rotates plane polarized light um, in the structure and that an antimer rotates it one way or the other. And so that's the phrase. You don't need to know all the specific details with this. Now, you might have multiple chiral carbons or centers, okay? And this brings up a new type of optical isomer, or I guess another, yeah, another type of optical isomer. And so let me illustrate this here, okay? Let's, for example, say we have something like this. 
And we have to imagine that there's a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. Okay. So notice that each of these carbons here, this one and this one, they are chiral because they have four different groups attached. One H, one OH, and then a chain going the left direction and a chain going the right, which are different. So we'd say this has two chiral carbons. And the thing is, if we take this same structure and we make a mirror image of it, it's going to look like this. So notice how we flipped the wedge and the dash here. Like I was saying earlier, we flipped the wedge and the dash um, as to make the enantiomer. And notice that both chiral carbons, we flipped them. So there is a mirror image. But the issue is sometimes when you only have one flipped and one not flipped, you run into another type of isomer. So you might run into something like, let me show you something like this. Let's say I flip one, but I don't flip the other one. Or let's say... I flip this one, but I don't flip this one. These two are called diastereomers because they are non-mirror images. Because not every single chiral carbon has been mirror imaged. So therefore, they are a different structure, but they are not a mirror image. And so when you have more than one chiral carbon, you have the possibility of diastereomers. Okay. And essentially, let me make sure I say this right. Oh. Uh, You will have um, more and more diastereomers the more and more chiral carbons you have. Okay. So non-mirror images of a chiral molecule that has more than one chiral carbon is known as a diastereomer. Questions about that? Okay, that is essentially the uh, majority of Topic 20 HL review. And so knowing enantiomers, optical isomers, diastereomers, knowing G um, other stereoisomers such as cis, trans, and E and Z, and then knowing all the mechanisms that you have to be able to replicate because I guarantee you one of them is going to be on there because the IB likes to take advantage of that for HL students to make sure that they are able to um, apply those mechanisms. So. Um, make sure that you're very familiar with those different mechanisms.